So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project, our monthly webinar for February. Um, today's webinar, we're going to be talking about freshman disorientation, navigating college on the autism spectrum. And we are joined by Amy Gravino, and she's going to introduce herself here in a second. Um, but just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. So my name is Kirsten Bayer, and I am with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. Um, I'm the Digital Communications Manager, so I will be the tech support and facilitator um, along with Amy's presentation today. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, about the session today or have any technical difficulties as well. I'd be happy to help you. So you can um, reach out to me via the chat or the Q&A which let me make sure everybody can participate in the chat. My Zoom settings have been kind of wonky lately. So um, if you were trying to chat good morning in the chat, you weren't able to before, but now you can. So everybody can chat everyone now. Um, so you can feel free to post in the chat or the Q&A if you have any questions. Um, we are on the Zoom webinar platform, not Zoom meeting. So really what this means is it looks very similar, um, but you cannot unmute yourselves um, or turn on your camera. And so it's really more of that presenter format as opposed to Zoom meeting is more collaborative. Um, so since this is a webinar with a presenter, it's that more presenter format. Um, if you do have questions or comments or concerns during the webinar, we ask that you just post those in the chat or the Q&A, and then we'll have time for that at the end the session and um, I'll visit that. So a little bit about um, who we are at ADA in our center. So at the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support, um, we have a multitude of grants and projects that we work with, um, with different state agencies. And we are in collaboration with the Illinois State Board of Education to um, host the Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project. And what that project is, is we develop and present resources that assist individuals with autism in their transition. So we specifically focus on the transitional piece, um, whether that transition is from secondary to post-secondary education, or that transition is from secondary education to the workforce um, or employment, we provide in the transitional piece of what that looks like for um, an autistic individual or individuals with autism, um, as well as we provide resources for their family members, um, employers, stake and other stakeholders, um, and we provide training and support. We provide um, resources um, to, to all those important stakeholder holders um, so that we can help create and develop a more equitable experience for all um, autistic individuals or individuals with autism. So a little bit about our center. Um, so ICSPS, it is a long acronym, but there's our logo down in the left corner. Um, we host, like I said, a multitude of grants and project, projects in collaboration with different state entities throughout the state of Illinois. We serve the whole state of Illinois um, and we create and support professional development, conferences, um, resources for education professionals across Illinois. Uh, we provide technical assistance. We do webinars. We develop publications, uh, facilitate program improvement strategies, and we specifically focus on that transitional piece, recruitment, retention, and completion um, for those students throughout the state of Illinois. And we encourage achievement of special populations and special population learners. Um, we were founded in 1977. And we are housed in collaboration with the EAF department, the Edu Educational Administration and Foundations Department within Illinois State University. Um, so we are very excited to work in collaboration with ISBE on the Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project and bring you today's webinar. Um, so again, like I said, collaboration with ISBE. And then here's our website. I'll put the URL so you can click on it um, directly in the chat here momentarily. But the autismcollegeandcareer.com, that's where you're going to find any upcoming webinars. We have some that are coming up in March and April and May and June. Um, so you can find and register for those on our website. You can also find the recording from all of our past webinars and today's recording and presentation slides will be up there as well. And again, I'll put the URL in the chat here momentarily, but every resource that you would need from our project, you can find on our website. It's our one-stop shop. Um, so it's really awesome that we have that. 
So we're going to move into some polls, just some beginning analytical polls that we do every webinar for our own analytics for our project. It also just helps the presenters kind of gauge who you all are that are joining us this morning. So the first question is, which region are you located in? So if you could go ahead and answer that. And then if you scroll down, the second question is which ADA stakeholder do you best represent? So if you could go ahead and participate in the polls, they should be launched for you now. And um, I'll give everyone a minute to do that. And then while you're all doing the polls, I also wanted to mention that today's session is being recorded and the presentation slides are already available to you on our website. Um, the recording from today will be up within about 48 hours. We have to allow for editing of closed captions. Um, so 48 business hours, and that will be up on our website. You can send the recording to any other stakeholders that you feel like would benefit from this information. Um, and then... Also, that brings me to saying that we do have closed captions on, so feel free to turn that on if you need it for accessibility reasons or note-taking purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Looks like most of you are joining us from Chicago area or East Central Illinois. One person from down Southwest, so thank you for joining us across the state. Um, and most of you are students or young adults and or you fall into the post-secondary system maybe a community member or a family member as well. So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and we appreciate your participation in those polls. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to our presenter today, Amy, let her introduce herself and start the presentation and reach out to me if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much, Kirsten. I really appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. My internet connection's being a little funny at the moment, so hopefully it'll hold up through the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, let me get this, get the ball rolling. Um, okay. So welcome all, again, it's a little weird, we can't see each other, uh, but I know you're here and you're listening and I appreciate your attention uh, um, this uh, Wednesday morning. I had to remember what day of the week it was. <laughs> so this is freshman disorientation, navigating college on the autism spectrum. Uh, and as Kirsten said, my name is Amy Gravino, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about myself in just a minute. Um, so several years ago, I received an email from a woman who was a reader of my blog. She was the mother of a newly diagnosed nine-year-old girl on the spectrum. And she said that, you know, we don't know any older women on the spectrum. Older is relative, of course. But uh, and it would be really great if you could, you know, write a letter to your younger self as a way of giving advice to, to us, to, to our family, and to all the families of, you know, girls and, and people on the spectrum who are newly diagnosed. So I want to share this with you and help to kind of bring you into my world, to familiarize you with what it was like to be me uh, when I was nine years old and looking at what I was facing, going into young adulthood and going into college. Dear Amy, I know you're feeling pretty bad right now. The other kids make fun of you a lot, and you don't know why. You're trying really hard to be friends with them, doing all the things you think they want you to do, and it's just not working. But there is one thing you should know, it's not your fault. Other people might say that, and you won't be able to listen to them, but I am hoping that you will if it's coming from me. It's not your fault. Say it over and over in your head when you feel the worst, because that's when you'll need it most. It's not your fault. How can it not be your fault? You'll say to yourself as the next few years go by, Everyone else can do this, can make friends and be normal. Why can't you? That's just one of the many questions I know you have, questions you don't know how or are afraid to ask. They make you feel overwhelmed, like sitting in Mrs. St. Pierre's classroom every day, fidgeting nervously in your seat. You always get up during class to sharpen your pencil, and I know it's because you enjoy the smell when they're freshly sharpened. It calms you down. So don't feel bad if the other kids snicker or laugh when you smell your pencil. They just don't understand. You care a lot about what the other kids think of you. I know you hate going to pool every week because you have to change in the locker room and the girls make fun of your feet. This will cause you not to feel comfortable wearing flip-flops for many years and you won't be okay with wearing them again until you're much older. It'll be like that with a lot of things people say to you in school. Their exact words might fade from memory, but the effects they have on you will last a long time. 
But don't worry, one day you're going to make friends with someone who really loves your feet and will call your little toe, the one that didn't grow in quite right, your lucky toe. That's something you feel like you could use a lot of right now, luck. You keep hoping things will get better, but they never do. I have some good news though, you won't lose that hope. No matter what happens, you'll still be optimistic. Foolishly, maybe, but when you're older, people will tell you how wonderful it is that you are that way. But I have to be honest with you. Things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. You'll be in junior high school soon, and you don't know it, but seventh and eighth grades will be two of the worst years of your life. Once again, it's not your fault. You like to look at things outside the window. The trees and blue sky make you feel calm. One day you'll be in study hall, and you'll go right up to the window and stick your head out of it. That's when someone will tell you to jump. Other voices will join in, and even after the teacher finally tells everyone to be quiet and calms things down, you'll hear them in your head for a long time to come. Every single day, someone will make you feel less, not human, unwanted, and you'll keep your head down and take it because no one's going to tell you anything different. But I will. You're not less, Amy. You're more. More because you have to work twice as hard as everyone else to make your voice heard. You don't know how to fight right now, except for when you lash out after not being able to handle the pain anymore. And then it's you who gets into trouble instead of your bullies. They know how not to be seen and to avoid detection. You don't. Even as an adult, you won't quite fully master the art of subtlety. But right now you're bared to the world, completely vulnerable. And your classmates are taking full advantage of that fact. They know how to hurt you in the worst ways so they can get their kicks from your reactions. You can't understand what they're doing and you just play straight into their hands every time. Once again, it's not your fault. These days, your classmates call you names. Ugly, freak, psycho, loser, retard. They call you these things because they don't know you, don't care to, and don't want to. You're trying so hard to force yourself into their world with little to no success, but you will have friends one day, Amy. Better still, you won't have to fight for their friendship they will come to you. I know how unbelievable that seems, especially since you feel like no one wants to be around you at all, not even your parents. But you are loved, even if you don't realize it. You just have to learn how to love yourself. There are some things that you're good at, Amy, like writing. You just started writing some poems and you were happy when you saw them published in the local paper. Your mom and dad sent them in for you just in case you were wondering how that happened. I have three words of advice for you. Keep doing it. Right now, you write because it's an escape from the world around you, and you don't care about being good at it. But one day you won't just be writing for yourself, you'll be writing to help other people. And your writing will help people even when you don't realize it. So you've got to keep at it. It's hard to think that you're good at anything when people are constantly telling you that everything you do and are is wrong. In middle and high school, your fellow classmates will tell you to your face to kill yourself and that no one wants you around or would care if you were gone. Don't listen to them. I know it's difficult and their words will go right into you, but they aren't worth it. You are a good person, a person worth having around and you'd make so many people sad if you were gone. The world is going to need you when you grow up, Amy. So you have to get there. You have to make it through these dark days because you're going to make a difference in the future. Someday people will wanna hear what you have to say and you won't believe it at first, but it will be meaningful and wonderful. You're going to have to take a lot of crap and go through a lot of pain to get there, but I promise you it will be worth it. My time with you is now growing short, Amy. I hope that some of the things I've said have brought you comfort, or at least given you assurance that there is indeed light at the end of this tunnel. In short, things will get better. A lot of people will say that to you and you'll think that they're crazy or just trying to make you feel better, but it's really honestly true. You're an incredibly special, talented girl, and right now you're toiling in obscurity as so many great artists do. But someday the world is going to see how amazing you are. And all you'll think is, where were you people when I was younger? The future seems far away, almost impossible to think about. But don't be afraid to think about it. You're not even sure if you're going to have a future, but you will, you will. And I'll say to you now three words that you don't hear very often, even when your mother says them to you. Three words that you'll be desperate to hear when you get older, especially from a good looking member of the opposite sex, but that seem very far in the distance right now. I love you. I love you, my younger, high strung, spastic, uniquely wonderful self. And I'll be here waiting for you. See you in 15 years. Love and many hugs, 
your 26 year old self. So this was, you know, something I came to discover in the intervening years is all the things that were written about me and said about me by the so-called experts, right? We, we turn to people to tell us things about students on the autism spectrum, but the things that people write and say have such power and weight to them. This was one of those things. Let's see if she finishes high school. College is not probable. She'll probably wind up in a sheltered workshop. Now this came from the director of special education in my school. This is what the director told my parents. And many parents of children on the spectrum believe these words because these are coming from people who we consider to be an authority. Um, and we don't do this to neurotypical children. We don't decide who somebody is when they're a kid and, and decide that that's who they're gonna be for the rest of their life. Some other things that were written about me. Amy does not understand the intricacies of interpersonal relationships. Amy is incapable of empathy. There were things written about my teeth, about my weight. When I was nine years old, this is when these things were being written. Nine, how does someone get to decide who somebody is when they're nine years old? So already at such a young age, the expectations for who I was and what I'd be capable of achieving were so low. And it was an enormous journey from this point to, to be able to even think about going to college. Um, Incidentally, not only have I gone to college, I also have a master's degree. So this director of special ed, you know, can kiss my butt. But uh, yes, yes, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. Some of these people do say these things to the students themselves. I, I had a similar experience. Um, I remember having one chemistry teacher in 10th grade, I think it was, uh, who halfway through the school year said, leave my class, don't come back. That I was unteachable, basically, because I had such a hard time with chemistry and sciences. Again, another defiance of autistic stereotypes, right? I'm terrible at math and science. I'm a writer. So I kind of am a minority of a minority of a minority. But teachers never knew what to do with me. And they didn't hide the fact that they didn't know what to do with me. Um, and this set the stage for so many struggles. Uh, so just to give you an overview of the topics we're going to cover today. Now that we've set the stage a little bit, I'm going to give you an, an introduction to college and autism. What are the obstacles, um, you know, that students on the spectrum may face? Why is it, why do we need to be talking about? Um, let me just remind myself. Oh, when you oh, okay, right, okay. So sorry, my brain went kerfluffy. Um, what what it might be like to encounter uh, a student on the spectrum in in college, uh, and then you know. We'll kind of go into the differences, the ultimate fundamental differences between high school and college. Um, because again, people that when we do that thing that I just described, where we decide, you know, who somebody is when they're nine years old, we think that the challenges that someone faces then are going to be the same ones that they're going to somehow be facing when they're 19 or when they're, you know, or when they're in high school. And that's not so. So the challenges, the obstacles that maybe many autistic students can face uh, in high school then become different in college. And, and how do those affect autistic students? So we'll be going over a lot of that. Um, and including, of course, the difference as well between services and supports in high school versus college, because those are those fundamentally change quite a bit as well. Um, and then I'll be sharing with you my experiences uh, as a woman on the spectrum. Uh, as I you know, said, those things were written about me when I was nine. I was formally diagnosed when I was 11. Um, so you know, again, it was kind of a miracle that I did end up going to college, given the fact that it wasn't expected that I would. But I'll share with you kind of a little bit of my story and, and, and what were the things that, that I had difficulties with and how I overcame a lot of those challenges. Um, and then we'll have some strategies. We'll have strategies for, I know, I guess you, you guys, you all support folks on the spectrum. I have some stuff that's geared toward, um, you know, the college like support office people. Who, this When I give this, typically it's more uh, more towards folks uh, working at colleges, it's kind of, but th th this stuff I think is all applicable as well when we're, when we're talking about the transition to college. So all of this really starts long before so, you know, somebody ever begins matriculating at a college or university. So I'm, ho I'm hopeful that these strategies will, will be really useful. Um, and I'll have some resources to share as with you as well that kind of give a, a kind of a real rounded picture of you know, college and autism and, and what we can do to help people on the spectrum be successful in college. Um, 
And then of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, Kirsten is gonna be monitoring the uh, Q&A area and also the chat. So feel free to put your questions either uh, where it says Q&A or in the chat and we will collect those and I'll make sure to answer as many of those as I can uh, at the end. And you can you know, type comments throughout the presentation as well uh, as we just saw, so that's absolutely fine. I'm happy to hear from you guys. Feel free to chime in, especially since I can't see you. So it's like I'm talking to myself. Um, so uh, this is a great kind of look. This is a little video that I want to share. The Organization for Autism Research put out uh, a, a kind of a guide related to college and autism several years ago. Um, this is my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Gerhardt, who was the uh, Executive Director of the Scientific Council for OR. Um, so I wanted to share this with you to kind of give you a picture of what a college student on the spectrum can look like. Um, also a note on language, this video was made several years ago before the revision to the DSM. So uh, the, the, di the label Asperger syndrome is still used in this, even though that is no longer a diagnostic label. So just, it would now it would be uh, autism spectrum or autism. So. That when you first meet the person who has an Asperger syndrome label, you probably won't automatically default to thinking the person has such a significant difference that they would have a disability label. But as you spend time with the person and get to know them as an individual, you'll notice some differences about them, particularly when compared to the rest of your class. They may present with idiosyncratic patterns of behavior. They may present with very intense, very idiosyncratic interests. They may have very specific voice patterns in terms of prosody and tone. But what's common to everybody who has an Asperger syndrome label is a pretty significant challenge in understanding nonverbal behavior or social nuance. And understanding social nuance really is critical to success both in your classroom and in campus life. So that when you first so that kind of gives you a picture of you know what it means to have an autistic student in a college classroom. And that's again. When I give this, you know, I often am speaking to, to professors or I'm speaking to college support staff. So maybe some of you, you know, kind of might be aware of some of that already, but a lot of times, you know, many professors and many folks in higher education have no idea about what autism is or what an autistic student can be like. And they have no idea how to deal with accommodation needs and, and, and all these things. So we're, we're really kind of in, in, a, in a no man's land in a lot of ways here. Um, but to share with you a little bit about me and who I am, um, I'm the founder and president of ASCOT Consulting, which is my own organization through which I am an autism sexuality advocate and consultant. I do consultations over Zoom for uh, families, for individuals on the spectrum, for organizations. Uh, I'm also a relationship coach at the Rutgers Center for Adult Autism Services here in New Jersey, where I'm based. Um, I work with the participants in the SCALE and CSP programs on issues related to, rela to relationships, dating, friendships. Um, that's what I, I help them to do. I'm also a professional public speaker. Um, I've, I've gone all over to give presentations about my main area of research focus and interest is autism and sexuality, but I also obviously present about this topic and also about entering into adulthood on the spectrum. Um, I was recently featured in the film version of In a Different Key, which is based on the New York Times bestselling book that it became a film that was on PBS last year. Um, so I was very happy to be uh, interviewed for that. And uh, I recently co-authored my first book chapter with Dr. Gerhardt, whom you just saw, um, called Sexuality uh, and Sexuality Education with Individuals with Autism, What You Should Know But Probably Don't, which is in the Handbook of Quality of Life for Individuals uh, with Autism Spectrum Disorder. I serve on a couple different boards of directors, and I'm also currently writing my first book, which is a memoir called The Naughty Audie about my experiences with dating as a woman on the autism spectrum. So again, kind of a big jump, right, for me to go from the girl that you heard me talking about in my letter to my younger self to who I am now. That's a journey, right? And so we're gonna talk more about that in, in just, and, and, and that's exactly what we're seeing here, right? So this is my my dorm room, freshman year of college. Um, you can probably almost know intuitively that it's early 2000s by how gigantic the monitor is and everything just looks really old all of a sudden. Um, but I didn't, you know, I knew nothing about what college was going to mean for me. I mean, I knew I was going to go. I'm, I'm the daughter of two teachers. So not going to college was never an option. I couldn't even miss high school, even if I was bleeding out of my eyes. So it was definite that I was going to go to college. But what did that mean? What, what did it mean for me as someone on the autism spectrum to go to college? There were not specific supports for someone like me back then. Um, 
that I went to a, a small college in Pennsylvania because um, I, you know, I went to a small high school. I grew up on Long Island. Um, I had 88 kids in my graduating class, so I knew I didn't want to go to a gigantic university where I would just be completely lost. But again, there was a disability support office, but there were not specific services for autistic students. And a kind of, you know, a big barrier uh, in all this was, was that, you know, I needed to be able to ask for help. And I was very ashamed and afraid to ask for help. I felt like I should, you know, I should be able to do these things. And people tell me that I'm smart. And, you know, one of the worst things that people had said to me is, oh, I wouldn't even know you were autistic unless you said something. And that's, I cannot emphasize how much that's not a compliment because we, I, I know people mean it that way, but it kind of, I think we tend to, especially when we use labels like high functioning and low functioning, high functioning kind of ignores the challenges that people have and low functioning overlooks the, the gifts and the abilities that people have. So I didn't even know what kind of supports and services that I needed at this point. And that was something, again, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem that we're, you know, for, I'm gonna talk about as we continue on here. So in high school, right? These were the kind of the challenges that I was facing in high school. Um, you know, I was bullied uh, tremendously all through school. Um, it was kind of a running tally as to which was worse, being bullied or being ignored. Because at least if I was being bullied, the, the kids were acknowledging that I existed. But if you're ignored, it's like, you, know, you might as well not even be there. Um, so, you know, sometimes I almost preferred the bullying just because it, it, remi it was a reminder that I existed. Um, and, and that, you know, that lack of confidence was profound. You know, my self-esteem was just, just non-existent. Um, because of, of everything that I was going through in school, not only also with my peers and teachers. And then even when I would go home, I had a lot of clashes with my parents. I, I you know, my father, um, after I was diagnosed, I think it made him re-examine his own life through a new lens and realize that he's on the spectrum too, but never knew it. And so we, you know, we just couldn't understand each other, even though we maybe had that commonality. Um, maybe we were too alike, but I, I just had no escape from everything that I was going through. And that led to those feelings of, you know, feeling suicidal, which I felt from, I would say the age of 10, right up until I graduated. Um, just, you know, just being so isolated, feeling completely alone. Like I was the only one who was going through what I was going through. I didn't even know any other autistic kids until I was maybe 14, I want to say. Um, and, and the girl I became friends with who was autistic didn't go to my school, you know, so I, I was still alone five days a week, six hours a day. Um, and again, like I said, the school didn't know what to do with me because, you know, they had resource room, they had stuff for kids with like academic challenges, kids with learning disabilities. But the only time that I had challenges with my schoolwork was when my social problems got so bad that they began to affect my academics, right? We, we often talk about motivation. What motivation is there for me to do math problems if everybody hates me and I have no friends? You know, so, so I... I had no motivation to want to do the work because it wasn't changing my situation. It wasn't making things any better. And I didn't want to be there. I just didn't want to be there. Um, and then in college, you know, again, like I said, the problems that I had in high school didn't necessarily go away, but they became replaced by new problems that I encountered uh, as a college student. One of the biggest ones was being extremely naive, right? Being very trusting, not realizing that people can be duplicitous, can you know, present one face to the world and be something very different you know, in private. I, I was so close to that. I took people at kind of their face value. Um, and, and thus it often led to me being taken advantage of. Uh, in, in my case, it was particularly financially, but also emotionally, you know, by someone who saw that vulnerability in me and um, got me to spend money on them that I barely had with my first ever credit card with a $500 credit limit, you know, <laughs> and no clue about money management whatsoever. Um, so again, that was another big thing. Um, also having to deal with issues of organization for the first time, time management. Like these were things that I had no clue how to handle uh, when I went off to college. Um, you know, my dad was great with trying to show me how to, how to deal with money and, you know, taught me how to, to, how to write a check like anybody under 70 writes checks anymore, but he still does. <laughs> but I learned how to do that, you know. Um, but that was, again, just knowing how to manage money, knowing the, the value of things. Was something I, ha I had no clue about, um, you know, and then all these other things that fall under what we'll talk about in a minute, which is the realm of executive functioning. Those were things I had tremendous issues with. Um, and, and again, motivation is another one, right? So in this instance, the motivation, lack of motivation wasn't because of social issues. It was because, you know, you have to take a core 
core curriculum in college, right? Classes that are not related to your major. And I had no interest in taking, you know, a statistics class. What the heck am I going to do with a statistics class when I'm an English major? So it was, it, I just, I, could, I, you know, it was very difficult to, to feel that sense of motivation around stuff that wasn't related to my particular interest. And how do I deal with that? What, how do I, you know, develop strategies for coping with that, right? And then, of course, the big, big one, dating and sexual inexperience. That was a huge, huge one um, that I began to face in college because I had my first boyfriend. And I'll go more into that in a little bit as well. Um, so, you know, as I said, there are so many big changes between high school and college, right? From a legal perspective, right? These are some of the, the, the big differences when we're talking about entitlements as well. Um, you know, in high school, you have the IDEA, uh, but then in post-secondary ed, that's, that's instead covered under the ADA, right? Um, in high school, you're entitled to a free and appropriate education. You know, in college, it's like, okay, you know, you're, there's a non-discrimination clause, but it's not this, it, it, there's no guarantee that students on the spectrum are going to get the supports and services that they need. Um, you know, again, and you could see a lot of the other things here too. Um, you know, you have an IEP when you're in high school, right? And that's that's, that's created to meet your specific needs and supports. Um, and, and you're identified more in, in high school, right? The teachers know all, everybody kind of know, but then in college, that's not the case. So every single time you have a new course, you have to advocate all over again to a brand new professor, uh, you know, this, this stuff, um, and, and have to get, request those accommodations all over again. Um, it's so, so yeah, you can see that there are a lot of big differences between, you know, supports that are legally available to, to folks in high school versus in college. Um, and that creates a lot of, of the challenges that we end up facing. Um, so just kind of, these were the kind of the, the big things, again, that were things I noticed as well, being on, on the spectrum in college. You know, in high school, the day is structured, right? There's 40 minute blocks. Um, I remember, you know, when I, like when you would not be in school for, for a day, if you were homesick or whatever, it was like, it was like your whole world dissolved. Like, what do I do? Time suddenly is not broken into 40 minute blocks. I have no idea what to do with all this, all this time. And then college, is, it's even more augmented because, you know, you only have certain classes on certain days and then you have, you could have entire days with nothing but free time. How do you structure that? How do you, you know, create time to study? I've long been out of college and I still have difficulty structuring my day. So this is an ongoing process, believe me. Um, and yet we somehow expect autistic college students to have this all figured out. Uh, and we, we, and we I, I, you know, I think we almost set people up inadvertently for failure by assuming that people are just gonna figure this out without support. Um, again, like I said, in high school, teachers and staff have a relationship with, with the students' parents. They have, they, you know, information is shared freely. In college, you're legally an adult. Right, you're over 18, you're an adult. The college is not going to be sharing stuff with your parents unless the student, you know, gives that permission. Right. So there are so many instances that I, I have heard of of you know students on the spectrum who are are who are locked up in their room for their dorm room for weeks on end, and the parents never know what's going on because the you know the school can't tell the parents that. And and the child is not telling the parents how bad things have gotten or that they are having these challenges and need help. So it creates just more and more problems. Um, and as I said before, this was another big one. Everybody knows the student's diagnosis in high school, although fat lot of good that did for me. Um, I did have an, a diagnosis, but nobody knew what the heck autism or Asperger syndrome was back then. So I don't know, you know, that, 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 was, that wasn't necessarily helpful for me, but I think it's different now. But then again, in college, you have to choose to disclose your autism diagnosis. And disclosure is a, is a huge, huge thing. Um, my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Shore, said, you know, creating a hard and fast rule for whom to disclose is practically impossible, right? So there are, there are so many instances uh, in our lives where we are going to have to disclose that we have an autism diagnosis, be it um, in a college setting, be it in a workplace environment, be it when entering in a relationship, right? That's a conversation that you, you inevitably have to have some, with someone that you're romantically interested in. How do you know when to tell someone that? How do you know how to tell a professor that or an employer without being afraid of, of losing your job or not getting the job at all, right? It, it's, it's such a personal decision um, for every person. And there are just so many risk factors, um, you know, for, for us being on the spectrum with disclosing. In college, 
for me, what I found was that I was afraid to disclose because I thought that it would label me, it would mark me, it would, you know, suddenly make people have this this idea of oh oh well she's you know she is autistic so you know she's not smart or she's this or that because there were so many negative connotations associated with autism right unfortunately there still is a lot of stigma you know when people hear that word um, and I I had a lot of what we refer to as internalized ableism so so what that means is that the messages that we hear from the world about you know how it's bad to be autistic and it's bad to be different and disabled. I, you know, internalized all of that. That was my view of autism as something negative. Um, I saw it as a liability rather than an asset at that time. And so I didn't want to be associated with the word autism. Um, but then by not disclosing, by not, you know, going to the support office and, and being able to say this, then I wasn't going to get the help that I needed. And I think I set myself up for a lot more struggles uh, that way. But again, this is not an easy process for anybody. So we, this is something we need to get better at preparing, um, I think, autistic students for when they're getting ready to go off to college, is how do you disclose to the support office or to your professors? We have to kind of maybe even come up with a script even. You know, that's something that I've done plenty of in my life is scripting to an extent. That's helped me with countless situations, um, even my, my professional correspondence and emails. If I didn't have my kind of little template that I go by, my, my world would dissolve. Right. So we all we all I modify it, of course, you know, depending on who I'm emailing and what the circumstances. But I had to figure that out. that wasn't something that anybody gave to me. I had to figure that out. And I think I struggled more for it. So if we had a way to make the disclosure process, I think, a little bit easier, it might remove a lot of that anxiety and stress for individuals on the spectrum. Um, but so, again, uh, this is another video from from Peter from OAR. Um, talking a little, a little bit about what it would be like to have an autistic student uh, in class. And I get, I'm sure I, I saw from the polls earlier, a lot of you, you know, work in secondary education and you, you probably already know autistic students, but I think this is a good reminder. Who could be that student with Asperger's syndrome in your class? Well, quite honestly, it could be just about anybody. It could be that student that never stops asking questions and it could be that student who never asks a question. It could be that student who sits off in a corner all by themselves. Or on the flip side, it could be that student who plops themselves down right in the middle of everybody else, thinking they're gonna be part of that social circle. It could be that student who makes direct eye contact, never blinking and never flinching when they talk to you, or that student who never makes eye contact. Asperger's syndrome represents a broad spectrum of people, and it's up to the individual and to you to figure out how to best accommodate them within the context of your class for academic success. So Peter's absolutely right there, right? So again, there's no one way that, that an autistic student may present um, in a classroom setting, right? We, again, I think we tend to kind of paint people on the spectrum with a broad brush. And we, we there are certainly some commonalities. Um, you know, I think one thing we all have in common is that struggle with social uh, you know, social skills and reading social cues, and also the sensory challenges, right? I think most folks on, on the spectrum do have different sensory challenges of one kind or another, be it to bright lights, be it to loud noises, textures of food, clothing, whatever that may be. But beyond that, there, you know, we're all so different. Like autism is not homogenous, uh, even though kind of I think the world tends to want to see us that way. And so the supports that each student is going to need are going to look different too, just as each student looks different. Um, again, to quote my dear friend, Stephen Shore, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, um, which th that's exactly what we're talking about. So that's another challenge is that you, you might have a professor who has one autistic student one semester and then has them has a different student in, in the next semester. And they're like, well, I did this with my other autistic student. Why, why can I do that with this student? Well, it, that that support may not work for that student, even though they have the same diagnosis. And that's, again, that's the challenge, right? Is that it's not just about saying, oh, you know, you have an autistic student in your class. It's about, it's, you know, no, you, you, you have Jimmy in your class. You have a student named Jimmy who happens to be autistic. What does that mean? What does that look like for Jimmy? What kind of supports does he need to be successful in this class? And that's a tough conversation, right? For, for I think even professionals to have with college professors, let alone students on the spectrum on whom we place that bird. Um, Who could so what I was mentioning before, right? We were talking about executive functioning, all these things, so all these things tie into that. So self-advocacy, organization and prioritizing, time management, 
that all goes to this little area here. So um, in high school, again, you have that more of that structure, you have kind of clearer sense of how to budget your time, right? Um, it, to an extent, again, um, to this day, if, if somebody asked me, oh, how, how do you study for a test? I have no idea how I study for a test. I don't know. Um, I still haven't figured that out. And, and so study habits have always been a challenging thing for me to kind of wrap my head around. And all that ties ties into there, right? That 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 whole kind of executive thing with planning and, and organizing. And I mean, one thing I've learned now is, you know, I make lists. It helps me to make lists when I have things to do and to put a little thing next to each one so I can check them off as I complete them. I need that. Otherwise, everything just gets lost in the morass of my brain. Um, but again, kind of the biggest thing is that self-advocacy piece, right? You know, if you if you are someone on a spectrum, your whole life, everybody's telling you who you are, right? You have difficulty with this. You need help with that. You This is where you have a challenge. So everybody kind of seems to know you better than you know, better than you know yourself. And then you go to college and you have to advocate for yourself. But if you've never done that before, you're going to be lost, right? How, how do you advocate for yourself when you don't know who you are? I mean, all too often, I think you know, neurotypical kids get that opportunity to develop that sense of self-awareness that we as folks on the spectrum don't always have the same opportunities to do. A lot of that, right, stems out of fear, fear that parents have about what's gonna happen to my child when I'm gone, what's gonna happen when they go out into the real world, when they, if they go off to school. Um, but, you know, the thing to keep in mind is, is that, you know, your, you, <laughs> Your fear is not our responsibility, right? My parents, when I was in college, you know, I thought about whether or not I should get a job and they would say, your job is to be in college and go to school and get your degree. And so it, it, there was a real kind of clear line about what my responsibility was at that time um, as a college student. And we all too often, I think parents don't intend it, you know, because I know it's scary to be the parent of a child on the autism spectrum. I'm sure it is. I, I have no doubt of that whatsoever. But when we push that fear onto our kids, that creates an additional kind of barrier that is going to make it that much harder, right? Because I know for me, trying to advocate for myself, it became hard because I had all the expectations or lack thereof of my parents and of my teachers in resonating in my head, you know? So we, we can't, even as professionals who support students on the spectrum, the concerns and the fears that you have, you're absolutely justified in having them and you want to support your students the best of your ability, but you also don't want to push those fears onto the student and make them responsible for, for your feelings. Do you know, what I, you know what I'm saying? So I just, I just, you know, want to put that out there because then it, it, it I think it inhibits all the rest of this too, in a lot of ways. Um, like, for me to go off to college and to want to try and to do all these things that I had never done before and to try to, to, to make a mark in the world, I had to believe that I had something to contribute to the world, first of all. And I didn't for the longest time. My, my goal you know, for having a, a bachelor's degree in English was to write poetry in a cottage in the Italian Alps. That was what my original you know, life goal was. But the problem with writing poetry in a cottage in the Italian Alps is that you do it alone. And that was how I saw myself, was alone because I didn't think I had a place in the world. And everyone, everything around me inadvertently was reinforcing that, right? So that's, we, we, we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna send the message to someone of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help you find your place in the world. And, and you know, it, it, you, you have all these problems and, you know, if, if I didn't have to worry about all this, you know, like, I feel like I'm not articulating this the best, but you know what I'm trying to say. We want people who are on the spectrum to be able to develop that sense of self-awareness freely and independently of, of our ideas and expectations of who they are and of what autism is. That's what I'm getting at. Um, so a little tangent there, I do apologize, but it ties into everything we're talking about. Um, so again, like I was saying, you know, in college, um, I, I was encountering a lot of these firsts for the first time, um, you know, having to use the Office of Disability Services having to deal with a core curriculum um, versus the classes that were related to my major, the things that I was actually interested in, not knowing how to study, right? Again, that, that, that was totally bewildering to me. I, I, I don't know, how do you know how long to study for? 
like it's like now when I try to figure out a, a workout regime, I don't know a regimen. I don't know how long do I work out for. I, I have no idea. How do people do this for fun? Why is sweating fun? It's not fun to me. Studying is not fun to me, but you have to do it right for when you have tests and stuff. So I that was a whole new kind of experience. Learning how to break down assignments into smaller pieces. Again, I would get very overwhelmed when I would get a big project assigned because all I would see was was the big picture. I, I, I couldn't see how to break it into smaller pieces to make it more manageable. And then because I would get overwhelmed and I would avoid doing the work until the last possible minute. Um, incidentally, I work really well under pressure, but still that doesn't mean you should wait to do stuff like that till the last minute. So all of this was stuff that I had to negotiate, you know, being in college and, you know, trying to, to, to get help for things that I didn't even know how to express or articulate about myself because I didn't know myself well enough yet. Um, and, and then on top of all that, the academic stuff, there's also the life skills stuff, right? So these are other things that autistic college students can and do face when they go off to college. Showering, right? Okay, I, I, I'm not bragging about this by any stretch, but when I was in high school, I remember going on a trip for, I think it was Habitat for Humanity we were in upstate New York by Lake George, I think it was. And I didn't take a shower for the whole weekend that we were up there because until that point, my dad had always run my shower. Um, so, you know, he would pull the knob and, and get the water done. So I didn't know how to run my own shower until I was like 18. And again, that's we, that's something I think we, you know, um, we, we create the sense of learned helplessness among people on the spectrum, right? We, we feel like, oh, it's just easier if I do this for him. And then we, then people go off into the real world and into college and they can't do these things that we need to know how to do, right? And doing laundry. Again, that was something I had never done until college. My dad does the laundry in our house. And so I had to learn how to you know, go down to the laundry room and how, how do you use the card or whatever and how much detergent do you use? And um, again, my father, you know, on the spectrum, so you got to separate the whites and the colors and the warmers and the, and the colds. And, you know, we, we don't just chuck everything in there. That's just anarchy, right? So I, I, that was, I had to learn how to do all that. And like all the other things I was telling you about, you know, going to the cafeteria, right? That was a huge thing. Navigating a cafeteria, it was overwhelming when I when I first started going. Um, and I remember a huge difference, you know, because when I was in high school, I never ate in the high school cafeteria. It was much too loud. It was it was socially a nightmare because nobody wanted me to sit with them. I had nowhere to sit. So I would eat in the teacher's lounge or I would eat in the nurse's office. Um, so then, you know, going to a cafeteria in college, I remember in my freshman year for the first time in my life, some kids, you know, invited me to sit with them. And it, it was it was like the heavens opened up. It was a miracle but I still had sensory challenges, right? So I would I would have all my food on the tray on separate plates and I would have separate forks for, for every food item, right? So that was a whole new thing, like just navigating the sensory challenges and social challenges of, of going to the college cafeteria um, and, and beginning to cook also. I, I started you know kind of cooking in my senior year of college. We had an on-campus apartment and, and I remember the first time I ever made chili, I made the mistake of using Indian chili powder instead of like Mexican chili powder. So like four tablespoons of that. And I was, I was sweating so bad. I had to take my shirt off because it was so spicy, you know, all these things, right? These are the things you start to learn when you go off into the world. And I had to make mistakes to learn from them. That's, that's kind of the big thing, right? Is that so, so many times we're afraid for an autistic student to make a mistake, right? Because we think that that's the worst thing in the world. And it's not. The worst thing in the world is to make a mistake and not learn from it, or to be so afraid of making a mistake that you never put yourself out into the world, right? But the only way that we can, you know, learn how to pick ourselves back up is by falling down. So I had to go through all of this, and you know, nowhere did I make more mistakes. I think than in the in that social realm, um, as I said, you know, I was bullied all through school, and then in college, I, I for the first time ever, I had a little group of friends, which was totally new for me. Um, I met all different kinds of people, you know, in college. I, I started, you know, meeting like gay people and meeting people from different socioeconomic backgrounds and people different races and religions and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, here, this is was my best friend in college. And I met her in my freshman year and she lived on the same floor as me in the dorm. And as it turned out, she had an older brother who was on the spectrum. So she automatically understood me in a way that no one else did. And I I kind of, you know, clung on to her and, and she called me her little one and I called her mother superior because she was this close to becoming a nun 
when we first started college and she is not a nun thankfully but I think I corrupted her slightly but um you know so so like when we were in a in a bar one time this kind of hole in the wall you know dive um they were it had a beach theme this particular night and there was sand on the floor and, and it was really loud and crowded and so I knelt down and I started kneading the sand in my hand because that that's a self-soothing thing that I do I've done that since I was a kid I used to do it with flour at my grandma's house and I was doing it with the sand and she looked down and she saw me kneading the sand and she goes oh Amy's overwhelmed and she just knew you know what was going on I didn't have to explain and I never had that before in my life and it was just the most amazing thing to you know because constantly we have people on the spectrum are having to explain ourselves we have to explain ourselves all the time to get people to to believe either that we need support and services or to believe that we're feeling the emotions that we're actually feeling. And I didn't have to do that with her. And it was extraordinary. But the biggest thing as well was kind of learning how to be a friend, which was something I, I hadn't done before. Um, you know, if you want friends, think about what kind of friend you want to be to people. Think about what, what, what does friendship mean to you? I'd never had really, you know, any concept of that before because I just so desperately wanted friends that I had no idea of, of what it really was to be a friend. So that was kind of a whole new development. And then, like I said, I had my first boyfriend freshman year and then my group of friends didn't like my boyfriend, which was a whole new thing as well. How do I negotiate that? That was a whole new experience. So um, like I said, and I go into this in far greater detail when I give my sexuality presentation, which I'll actually be doing for Atta in July. So I hope you'll come and attend that one as well. But um, I, you know, I, I was so desperate for a boyfriend all through high school. I thought if I have a boyfriend, everything will be fixed and I'll be happy and things will be great. Uh -huh. um, oh, sorry. Let me just shut that off. I had a feeling that was going to happen. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the, kind of having to figure out how to na navigate all this when I had absolutely no clue. I call him my starter boyfriend, you know, because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I, and I put this here you know, because he, he, you know, did kind of end up dumping me and my friend, my group of friends were right, you know, that he was not a great guy. He, you know, he dumped me, we got back together and then he dumped me again. Um, and that was kind of a, a whole other thing. And uh, it just figuring out how to, how to balance all these new demands that had never existed in my life before. Academic studies, having friends and being in a relationship, completely new territory, not a clue as to what I was doing, no idea. Um, but uh, the thing was, is that, like I said, I didn't know what it meant to be a girlfriend. And so I kind of tried to play the role of a girlfriend. Well, what, what, what do I do? I, I have to laugh at his jokes, even if they're not funny. I have to go where he wants to go. I have to be nice to his parents. And I call I call him my starter boyfriend, like I said, because I had no idea what I was doing. And um, and, and I, I kind of found myself in this position of deferring to him because he had more experience. And I thought, well, I'm the one who's autistic. I'm the one who's broken. And, and I didn't have the confidence the, or the ability to kind of state my own needs or feel like my needs mattered. And part of that is just being a woman in our society. Part of that has nothing to do with autism, but part of it was related to autism and, and being vulnerable and being someone that somebody like him could take advantage of and could mistreat because, you know, I, I just didn't have that confidence or that sense of self. Um, and I know I said that the picture wasn't available, but, um, you know, here's the interesting thing, right? So. When, when he dumped me, when, when we broke up, you know, normally when, when a breakup happens, right, you, you know, you, you cut the other person out of the picture. I cut myself out of this picture, right? What, what, what does that tell us, right? That I felt like it was my fault, that there was something wrong with me, you know, because again, I was in this place of, you know, if, if, if things, if, if we break up, then nobody will ever want to date me again. That was the place that I was in mentally at that point. Um, and so, when that did happen, I, I, you know, again, took it on myself that it was my fault. And is it, you know, even after we broke up, I thought that we should still be friends. Cause again, I still was in that, that thing of somehow ne believing that I needed to maintain that connection to know that I hadn't failed completely. But um, he turned it into kind of an emotionally abusive jerk after that point, um, taunting me and saying terrible things about me. And, um, you know, so we lived in the same dorm building as it were, this was in my sophomore year, I do believe. Uh, sophomore, junior, maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. It was 2003, whatever the heck that was. But uh, So uh, I lived in a solo room on the, on the third floor of this building, and he and a mutual friend lived on the first floor. And, you know, one night we're out on the stoop, the front stoop of this building. It's about two o'clock in the morning, and, and the mutual friend is having a cigarette, and I'm talking to him, trying to talk to him. 
And my ex is like, you know, go out it, go away. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. Get out of here. Leave us alone. And I'm, you know, I, I weighed all of about 95 pounds at that point, soaking wet. And I'm like, it's a free country. I have every right to be out here. And he proceeded to physically assault me, uh, which I guess sort of sounds worse. You know, but what actually transpired was that he uh, smacked my forehead with the back of his hand and he kicked me in the shin. Um, and he was six foot three and um, you can't tell from Zoom, but I'm, I'm five foot zero. I'm short. So it wasn't really an even match. And, uh, you know, so we go back inside and my mutual friend is like, Amy, just go get the RA. Just tell her what happened. I'll back you up. Just go get the RA. Go. So I got the RA. I made a report um, to the on-campus police. I wound up going to the, the, the city police filed for a protection from abuse order, which is similar to a restraining order. Uh, my friend testified on my behalf because he witnessed what happened. I wound up winning the protection from abuse order. Um, my ex had to move out of the dorm, no third party contact. Uh, we had an on-campus hearing as well, you know, with the Dean of Student Affairs. And because um, apparently I can't have a relationship and normally uh, as far as I know, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was up to that point, the most kind of traumatic thing I'd ever been through, I guess. Um, but it also you know, showed me a strength that I had in myself that I didn't know that I had. And I think that for many autistic individuals, we, we are so, we, we are resilient, but it's because we're forced to be resilient. We shouldn't have to be, but that's the position we find ourselves in because we have to try to, to exist and thrive in a world that's not built for people like us. We, we are, we're up against it all the time. And so I found this inner strength in me through this that I didn't even know I had. Um, or at least it was the start of me finding that inner strength. But um, it was, yeah, it was definitely, you know, a life altering experience at that particular time. And just, you know, it, and it definitely altered the course of my college experience too, right? To go through something like that and to have something so painful happen. Um, but again, you know, that that's just one of the challenges that students on the spectrum can face. Um, bullying is still an, an ongoing issue. I mean, I think we should really just call it what it is, which is abuse, right? I think bullying almost sugarcoats what it is, is that many students on the spectrum can experience abuse at the hands of other students and at the hands of professors or even support staff. And like I say, abuse can come in many different forms. It can be verbal, it can be emotional, God forbid physical, but this is a position that many students on the spectrum find themselves in when, when they don't have the proper supports and services in place in college. And then what I alluded to earlier, that sense of isolation, right? You have students who are afraid to leave their dorm rooms because um, they're too overwhelmed by the, the, the demands of college, the academic demands and the social demands and just not knowing what to do, not knowing how to ask for help. Um, and, and I hate that, you know, that that fear of help is such a common thing, I think among people on the spectrum that, you know, e either we have no expectations for autistic students or we expect far more than we do for neurotypical students, right? Like, I don't, I don't know why that is. Why, why we do that? Why we can't just let autistic students just be human, right? Um, we, we kind of have this thought that it, that if an autistic student doesn't do this at this particular point in their life, that they'll never do it, right? That's not so. You know, I th there are skills that I developed that I started to develop in college that continued to develop after college. Right or, or things that maybe people thought I should have been able to do in college. Okay, maybe I couldn't do them right then. But then as time went on, as, as I matured, as I gained more life experience, I became able to do those skills. Um, one example, again, this is like a tiny thing, but um, for the longest time, I couldn't braid my hair, right? Again, I know this is probably sounds like a silly example, but no matter what I tried, I just could not braid my hair. I couldn't do it. I had a lot of sensory issues too around my hair being touched. It often hurt to have my hair combed or brushed, but I would be, I would feel so frustrated. Like, why can't I just braid my hair? And then all of a sudden one day, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the heck switch clicked on in the universe, but suddenly I knew how to braid my hair. I could just do it, right? So sometimes skills are like that. Skills click on when we don't expect them or or or, or want them to, but they, they they just do. So we I think we have to kind of put less of the focus on putting autistic people on our timeline and, and looking at what the autistic person's timeline is. What is your trajectory going to look like, right? I'm not here to do what everybody else who's come before me has done. I'm here to do what I'm doing, to, to, to live my life on my terms because it's the only one I have. I can't live anybody else's life. I can't be the same type of college student as Susie or Johnny and do whatever they're doing. 
that's that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to be Amy and and to you know, get my degree, obviously, but to figure out what being in college is going to mean to me ultimately. Um, another example, right? So we think about, you know, we think about partying a lot in college, right? I went to one party uh, in my freshman year. I remember it was, it was right close to campus. It was, you know, in a kind of a, an apartment building there. And I was in the party for all of 10 minutes. And I was like, yeah, this is not for me. You know, and, and of course, I think all through high school, I had desperately wanted to go to parties and be invited to parties and this and that. And then I finally get to one and, you know, you know what college parties are like? It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of funky smelling kids surrounded by beer bottles. And so it's like, no, this is, not a, this is not a pleasurable sensory experience for me. This is not working. And it's loud, right? Loud music, you know? No, wasn't my gig. And I, and I had to learn that. that I, I would never have known that otherwise. But that was, you know, that was something that I made a determination of at that point. Um, even with a lot of my other experiences, right? We, we often think about peer pressure. I never kind of succumbed to that in that sense. Like when, like when it came to sex, I had plenty of opportunities to have sex in college. I chose not to because I knew I wasn't ready yet, right? I didn't lose my virginity until I was 22. And that's a whole other story. But um, I knew I began to know myself in this way. I began to develop that sense of self that had been so absent all through my high school years. And, and I think I credit that with helping me get through college. I, I think if that hadn't been there, that you know, that's inner strength. I, I, I don't know where, where I would be. Um, but again, this is how a lot of people on the spectrum can end up in college is in, is isolated and afraid, you know, because of being overwhelmed by those challenges, right? We, we all want to think that we would rise to the occasion in those circumstances, but not everybody might, right? You might have someone else on the spectrum who would go to that same party that I went to and they would just get completely overwhelmed. And then they would feel overwhelmed, not just from the sensory experience, but from feeling like a failure. Like, oh, I finally get to go to a party and I, and I, and I don't like it. There's something wrong with me. Why can't I just enjoy this party like everybody else? And then, you know, kind of having a, a little internal meltdown over that, right? That's, that's a very real possibility. So that's why we can't, you know, look at the college experience and say, this is exactly what it should be like for every student, because there is no one college experience for every student. One size simply does not fit all. And that's absolutely true as well when it comes to autism. Even, even though some students you know, may need more structured social opportunities as well, that could, it be, could be more beneficial, right? But still, that may not be exactly the perfect fit for every student. But the alternative is people ending up in this state of isolation. And that's not good either. That's not a good or happy place to be. Um, so again, like I said, and that all ties into that anxiety and, and depression, right? That was... Those were things that I experienced um, certainly a lot in, in high school. Um, I had a, a, a tremendous, um, you know, I was diagnosed with depression when I was, was 12 uh, and I was put on medication for it, which I voluntarily went off of when I was 15. Um, but, you know, that those can be really amplified and magnified in college. And then, and again, the college is not required to report any of this to parents, right? So it's up to the autistic student to, to, you know, like go to the on-campus, um, you know, uh, clinic or what have you to ask for help. And many people are reluctant to do that, right? It's it's that whole thing of like, I'm here and I should be able to be you know, handling myself and taking care of myself. I don't want to ask for help. I just want to be okay. Um, and 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 I again, I know it, it, it's sort of simplifying it, but that was really what it was like for me a lot in college was that I, I you know, nobody had higher expectations of me than I had for myself, right? We, as people on the spectrum, I think are, are our own harshest critics. And we put, we have, we set very, very high expectations for ourselves. So if I felt like asking for help would be, would be, you know, um, failing to meet those expectations, I couldn't do it. I couldn't see, you know, the very real reality, which is that asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength because it means, you know, yourself and you know enough to know that you can't handle this particular thing. And that's okay. That's, you know, I didn't have that sense of awareness at that time. That was still a work in progress, right? But we just put up too many barriers, I think, that make it hard for autistic students to ask for that help. We need to make that process much, much easier. Um, so a couple strategies. Again, I, you know, I realize we may not have any professors here among us. I apologize if this, you know, may not be 100% germane to everyone who's attending today. But, um, you know, these are things also that you... As, as support staff can communicate to professors, right? That can be helpful for working with autistic students. Providing information in smaller chunks or in a visual format, right? And making sure that students on the spectrum understand that information, you know, not just assuming comprehension. 
Um, because there's also a difference between, you know, somebody can regurgitate and, and repeat back information that they've learned, but that's not the same thing as, as having comprehension and being and fully understanding, you know, that information. Um, being able to apply it kind of in real world practical settings. Again, I encounter this more with my work when it comes to sex education. That's, you know, somebody can, can repeat information perfectly, but it doesn't mean that they have the comprehension of that information to be able to apply it to real life situations. So that's kind of what we're getting at here. Um, again, a suggestion that, that you can give to professors about supplementing, you know, oral information with written instructions. Um, you know, again, this is me going by my experience in college kind of 20 years ago. I know now with technology, it's a lot easier um, if, if, if professors like use things like Blackboard or if they use, you know, um, like online stuff, having information available, having a syllabus available in a digital format, having lectures recorded, right? You, you can, you know, professors now can record themselves using Zoom, right? You could set up a thing and record like the whole thing and have that available somewhere in the digital platform. Um, just having other ways that information can be accessed, right? And um, and letting professors know as well that, you know, feedback is super duper important, right? If, if you're confused by something, you know, to be direct in the feedback that you give, right? All too often, I think professors and staff alike want to add extra information to, to the feedback they're already giving. So if you're trying to tell me something, information that I need to know, just tell me that one thing, right? Because if, if you pile two other things on top of that, then that's three things I have to process instead of just the one, right? I have to tell that to my own mother sometimes now. She'll, she'll, she'll give me an instruction to do something and then she'll be like, oh, and can you also, and I'm like, mom, one thing at a time, you know, like, let me just get this one thing done first, if, especially if it's a big task. You know, so it's it's not that I can't multitask, but then I have too much information floating around in my head, and that can lead to that sense of overwhelm. Um, and again, I think that's a hard thing for a lot of students on the spectrum of college to articulate, right? So, just some some good tips there. Um, oh yes, I have another video from Peter. I forgot. I thought there were three videos. Uh, let's see. We'll play this one for you for more strategies. Your student is there because he wants to be there, and your student is there to learn. Asperger's syndrome is not a disorder of motivation. If you have a student with Asperger's syndrome in your college class, it's because they deserve to be there. The issue now is to give them the skills so that they can most benefit from your instruction. And that's the key word here. Your feedback to them needs to be in the form of instruction versus criticism. Right, so that's a huge, huge thing there as well, right? That's what the other piece I wanted to touch on is that when we give feedback, right, to students on the spectrum, and I've seen this at every instructional level, I've seen this in middle school, high school, college, I've seen it from my own father, that, you know, the feedback when it, when it comes as a criticism, I shut down, right, I can't, I can't, in, I can't take that feedback in to me because I am feeling the disapproval and the, 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 the emotions that the person giving me the feedback is, is sending out. And so then I don't get the information that they're trying to impart to me, right? So giving giving feedback as as instruction, as here's what you can do, that that is so crucially important rather than just criticizing someone and saying here's what you did wrong, because um, because that doesn't give anybody a place to go from, right? That's just here's what you did wrong, but telling someone here's what you can do differently that gives someone a way to go forward, and that's what we want, right? Is for students on the spectrum to be able to go forward. Um, so again, for support office staff, for, for folks who are you know, working on, on campus with folks on the spectrum, um, it can be good to discuss with the student the area that causes the most difficulty, right? Sometimes a, you know, an autistic student may not even know which area causes the most difficulty. Um, so kind of you know, mapping things out, talking about what are the classes you like? What are the classes that you, you don't like? And what about, okay, in this class that you don't like, what in particular in this class is really hard? So kind of pinpointing. The, the things you know that are most challenging so that is not it's not so vague and nebulous that can help to kind of make things a little bit clearer and figure out um you know a way to move forward from there um again having written expectations can also be useful right um sometimes you know having again something tangible makes a difference um and, and, keep, and making sure that that's regularly updated and and, and creating expectations as well with the student. So not just creating those on your own, but in collaboration with the student, I think makes a big difference. You know, we, like I said, it's it's that 
with a kind of unintentional paternalism that we engage in a lot of times with folks on the spectrum that, you know, as, as neurotypicals, as the people who work with them, that, that we know best. But that, that again, is to the detriment of what I was discussing before, that sense of self-awareness, and that we as autistic individuals know ourselves better than anybody else, or at least we should, right? So working in collaboration with autistic students um, makes a tremendous difference. That's, again, something that I'm also negotiating with in my other work, which is encouraging collaboration between uh, researchers and autistic individuals. Um, so not just, you know, having people on the spectrum as as the subjects or participants in research studies, but collaborating with people. That, that is something that can start here, right? That's something that we can start so, so far before we get to that, that place. Um, and helping someone, you know, to set expectations that they feel that they can meet. Um, and then also providing opportunities, you know, to debrief about experiences. Because um, again, I know I had so many social experiences in college that were brand new that I had no idea how to process or or what they meant. And I didn't really have anyone I could talk to about those experiences. I didn't feel like I could confide in the, in the support staff you know, office. Because again, they were not set up to deal with autistic students. They dealt with students with all different kinds of learning disabilities and challenges. Um, so you know, if I had someone to talk to, to kind of bounce off of, you know, I went through this and, and you know, how did I handle this and what should I do in the future? That might've saved me a lot of heartache and a lot of the struggles that I went through. Um, and of course, there are some you know, issues that are you know, far deeper or more serious that would require you know, an, an outside therapist if necessary. Um, and again, that's, you know, this is also something I do. Like I consult with uh, college students on the spectrum about these kinds of things. I wish I would have had someone like me when I was in college who was on the spectrum, who'd been there, who could relate to a lot of what I went through. I've had so many of the people I've met with my clients have said to me, this is so different from any other therapist that I've met with. Like that, you know, the fact that I know that you, understand this you know, makes such a big difference. So never underestimate that, right? That you, and, and know as well that you as support staff who are not on the spectrum, you can't ever fully understand some of those experiences. And, and it's okay to not have all the answers, right? Sometimes the most powerful phrase you can say is, I don't know. I've said that to so many of, of my clients. I say, I don't know the answer to that, but let's find out together, right? So you don't have to be the expert on all of this. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to have that willingness to help and to what I call, what I refer to as give a crap. It's always better to give a crap than not, or give a damn, excuse me, that sounds better. Um, you know, because the students you work with, when they go out into the world and, and, and you're no longer working with them, they'll remember the people who tried to help them versus the people who only looked at them because they were being paid to look at them, right? We have that keen sense of awareness. I knew when the support staff and professionals that worked with me as a kid and in, in middle school and high school, I knew when they were looking at me because they genuinely cared versus because it was their job and they were just getting paid for it, you know? So that that also kind of connected into my motivation to also do better and to be there. What, what Why would I feel motivated, right? To want to be in school when even the people who are working with me don't really care about me, don't see me, you know? That was extremely painful as a kid to have that feeling and that knowledge, even if I, again, couldn't articulate it out loud necessarily. So again, sorry, a little tension there, but relevant still. Um, so just a few, two, two little example scenarios of, of challenges that students might encounter in college. So let's say we have a student named Bill, who's a med student. He's very talkative, very, um, very punctual, um, but he gets, gets overwhelmed by classroom demands, right? How can we help Bill? Um, so for professors, you know, something that you can say to professors is that they can talk to Bill outside of the classroom, make the suggestion of, of having earplugs available to Bill if he's having sensory issues with the noises or in, in the classroom. Um, also, you know, have the uh, option to have written or audio recorded lists, you know, summarizing the class discussion or like what I was saying before about having the, the, the lecture recorded on Zoom, now you can do that. Um, just having supplemental materials that might help Bill to break down the classroom demands into smaller tasks instead of being these big kind of overwhelming uh, things that Bill has to do. And then for parents and support staff, right, come up with methods for coping with stress, right? How do we deal with stress in the middle of class? Because that's different from then dealing with it outside of class. If you're in the middle of class and you feel that you're getting overwhelmed. What do you do? Well, can, can you know, is it okay to, with a professor that you get up and maybe go you know, go walk out in the hallway for a minute to take a deep breath. Is it okay if you may, or maybe if you have like something you can squeeze in your hand or you, you could have, you have noise canceling headphones that you could put on. 
I mean, those are all things that you can, you know, potentially use to help cope with that stress within class. And then outside of class, when you know, when you're when you're in your dorm room and you have to work on, you know, the the the, the um assignments for class. How what do you do if you start to feel overwhelmed with those? Well, can can you call mom or dad? Can you can you talk to them on the phone? Like I still do that. I'm a grown ass adult and I pardon my language and I still call my parents sometimes when I feel overwhelmed. And my mother is the best at talking me off the proverbial ledge. It's not that I need it that badly, but sometimes just having that calm voice helps me, you know, calm down the loud voices in my head that are yelling at me, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You're a fraud. You can't do this, that inner saboteur, right? So that's a potential strategy as well. And then also finding ways to make the material relevant to build interest, right? So if it's a class that's a core curriculum class, how can we, you know, make this relevant to, to, to what Bill's major is, or to something that, you know, he cares more about that will increase his potential motivation to want to complete that material. Um, another scenario we have, let's say we have Virginia, who's another student, she's an art student, very shy at first, and then she opens up when she gets more comfortable with people. Uh, but she's often late to class because of executive functioning issues, has difficulty with time management. Um, and, then, and then she also has difficulty working with other students on group assignments. I hate group assignments, no secret, never cared for them in college, still am not so thrilled with them even now, but I've, I've gotten better at learning how to kind of negotiate certain group assignments. But how can we help Virginia? Well, professors can assign roles for group members, right? I don't know why some professors think it's a good idea to let college students delegate the roles themselves. Uh, that's like Lord of the Flies territory there. Why would you leave that up to the students, you know? And, and having also very clear ex, you know, directions about the expectations. Um, for the project, right? Not just having vague instructions. So too many professors will have instructions that are way too not specific and then don't give enough clear information about what exactly is expected of each individual student within the assignment. And then also what's expected of the group as a whole in the assignment. Um, also potentially allowing options for individual work where possible, um, if that can help alleviate some of, the, of Virginia's stress. Um, for parents and support staff, help, you know, Virginia come up with strategies to deal with anxiety, right? That's, you know, I, like I said, I think I've had many meltdowns in my life and um, it's hard. I it, think that was difficult for me uh, when I was younger was recognizing the signs of a meltdown coming on because it would often feel like a freight train just hitting me, you know, but, but in reality, in actuality, meltdowns are something that, that slowly build over time. It's, it's kind of one thing on top of another until I could no longer contain all of those feelings. So, how could we, you know, how, how do we help Virginia recognize those signs of an oncoming meltdown? And then what, what can she do if she feels that oncoming? You know, can she go somewhere that she can have quiet and, and, and can take a breath? And, or is there someone that she can call who can, you know, help talk her, talk her through it? Or, um, and then also the, the whole, you know, idea of emotional regulation, which is something we talk about tremendously when it comes to students on the spectrum. Um, how do we help autistic students become better at emotional regulation. Again, that took me many years to learn and figure out as well. Um, that was always something I had a hard time with. So just having those ways that, you know, Virginia can have these, these things that can help her before it ever gets to the point of a meltdown happening. That's what we hope for. Um, but but it, even if the meltdown cannot be prevented, then what, what can we do to support Virginia through the meltdown as well? That That's something, you know, that staff have to keep in mind too, because when a meltdown starts, you, you can't stop it. The only way out is through. So that's a whole other you know, issue is how do we help parents, staff, professors negotiate when a student, if a student happens to have a meltdown in class, that's a whole other discussion. Um, so what can you do to empower autistic students? A few final thoughts. Um, you know, again, we tend to think that if someone is being quiet in class, if they're not saying anything, that means they're not engaged, or if they're not making eye contact, that it means they're not engaged. And that's simply not true, right? You know, for many students on the spectrum, all those sensory challenges and, and other things, um, those are often what prevent engagement. Um, so if you're forcing a student to make eye contact, forcing a student to sit still in a chair and not move, that student is, is so busy trying to do everything they can to regulate their body and to keep still and follow that demand that they can't then concentrate on what's being said by the professor or the teacher, right? So we have to find what works best for that student so that they, that you know, that they're taking in the information that you're trying to share. So, that, that means like what I said before about allowing a student to get up and walk around if they need to, having noise canceling headphones if you have to, right? And, and, and recognizing that what we would consider, you know, the traditional signs of a student not being engaged in class, it doesn't mean that they're not. Um, 
um, oh, Mirage uh, agencies, I, I'm not sure. Uh, feeling safer. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, those are, those are all great things. Thank you. Thank you for all those. Yeah. Um, and, and, and remembering, you know, that students uh, on the spectrum have as many similarities. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. How you feel having to go to the, to the next building. There's, there's so many different challenges that we're talking about negotiating. Absolutely. Um, and, and bearing in mind that, you know, again, we kind of want to tend to characterize autistic individuals as not being good at communication. I, I think rather it's more of a, of a reality that we have a different style of communication. And all too often, neurotypicals are not great at communicating with us and, and understanding autistic communication. So people need to be willing to listen, right? And need to be willing to be open to other styles of communication and to hear what autistic students are saying. It's a two-way street. The, the burden and the onus cannot all be on the student to try to change and to fit into this environment. It has to be something that we all work together on to ensure the success and happiness of the autistic students. Um, also, like I said, you know, a few final points. So advocacy starts way before college. That's something that we have to be focusing on when we're, individuals are in high school, when they're, you know, still needing to get supports and services, even as kids. That's we don't allow for that all too often when, when autistic people are younger. So that has to begin because if you just expect someone to suddenly be able to self advocate in college when they've never done it before, they are just going to be set up for failure. Um, like I said, you know, the other point to remember that skills do develop over time, not all at once. So again, that assumption of, you know, you, like you have to learn this skill right now or you're, or you're never going to get it. That's not, that's simply not true, right? So it, it can take time for those skills to happen, but that doesn't mean that they never will. And, and you know, remembering too, that the acquisition of skills, it's not always um, going to also maybe even look the way that would look for neurotypicals, right? So we we want to assess for, like we, we would say competency or what have you. Someone may know how to do a skill, but it could be in that particular moment that they can't do it for whatever reason. There could be you know, something causing the person to feel overwhelmed, or there could be a sensory challenge for preventing the person from, from doing that skill, but it doesn't mean that, that they don't know how to do that skill, right? Um, and then finally, like I said before, your fear is not our responsibility, right? So we, we have the responsibility of being who we are and trying to be successful and thrive in this college environment that's not built for people like us. And the, and the concerns that you have, yes, they're real, yes, they're legitimate. And, and, and I know it's a, it's a difficult thing to be called to be a, a parent of a child on the spectrum or to be a support, someone who supports students on the spectrum, but you have to, have to also let us be kids, let us be who we are and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Um, so just a couple of resources. Um, the videos that I had shared were from that Understanding Asperger Syndrome uh, guide from OAR. So that th this is the link to the full video there. And there's uh, more education resources on the OAR website also here. Um, there's a great book from Wolf, Brown, and Bork, Students with Asperger Syndrome, a Guide for College Personnel. I know it's a little old. Um, I'm working on uh, updating this with a few more new resources. There's also a great one from 2014 from ASAN, the Autistic Self Advocacy Network and Navigating College, a handbook on self advocacy. And this is written by and for um, students on the spectrum. Uh, so that, that's a really great resource. Um, thank you all so much for your time and attention. I truly appreciate it. This is my contact information here, uh, my email uh, and my social media handles. Um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you here today. And, um, and now we can go to questions, if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Looks like, um, I don't see any questions. I can't hear you, Kirsten, you're very low. I have headphones and maybe that's why. Oh yeah, it's very, it's, is it better now? It's no, it's still low.
Is that better? No, it's still it's still really low. What about that? Oh, there you go. Now, now it's good. Okay, I just took my headphones. I apologize, everyone. Um, so if everyone wants to uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat, um, you have a comment, it looks like from Jennifer, Amy, um, that says I'm reading an excellent book called The Reason I Jumped by a 13 year old Japanese boy with autism. You all may already know about it, but I just found it. Yes, that's a great book, Jennifer. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, that's a really, really powerful book. I've heard a lot of good things about that. So thank you for that recommendation. Awesome. And we have a, a couple more minutes left of the webinar. So feel free to ask Amy any questions or comments or things you want to run by her. Um, just a quick plug. I did put a survey link in the chat. Um, so you can feel free to take that regarding our webinar. And today's session was recorded. The recording and presentation will be up on our website, which was put in the chat earlier. I can put it in one more time for everybody, though. And you can ask anything. I, I have no filter that I'm aware of. So Feel free to ask me any question you feel like. You can also feel free to ask any questions on the follow-up survey um, or reach out to Amy or myself individually. I can put my email in the chat as well and we can get you your answers if we don't know them or we can reach out to Amy as well. Absolutely. I don't see anything coming in, Amy. Did you have any last remarks? Uh, not particularly, just, I, you know, I really appreciate you all being here today. And um, I'm, I welcome any feedback that you have about, about this presentation. So like Kirsten said, feel free to fill out that survey. And um, I just, I thank you all for taking the time. Uh, and I hope that this was useful and helpful to everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your Tuesday or Wednesday. Sorry, Wednesday. Uh, Thank you, John. Thank you very much.